I'm also going to put on the live transcript. Okay, so we should be able to go. So we're here this evening to um, get some feedback and input from the community on how we have moved so far with the implementation team. And I'm gonna do a brief introduction quickly by introducing the members here. We have um, town councilor Alicia Walker, who's former Community Safety Working Group co-chair. Would you like to say hello, Alicia? Hi, everyone, and thank you for being here tonight. And Brianna Owen, former uh, co-chair of the Community Safety Working Group. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And Mike Curtin, the dispatch supervisor. Good evening, everyone. Chief Scott Livingstone. Hello, everybody, and thanks for coming tonight. And um, the fire chief, Tim Nelson. Howdy, thanks for coming by. And uh, the captain of operations, Gabe Ting. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming up here and joining us. Thank you. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Alicia for a quick statement. Um, so I again just wanted to thank everyone for coming out today. We have <clears throat> a small um, slideshow prepared for you all to give you an update as to where we are in the implementation of the CRESS um, department. We just wanted to make a disclosure that all of this information that we are giving you today um, is information that we have all agreed upon but is still subject to change depending on um, we are in the process of hiring the director who we are looking for their input on many things um, as well as we expect things to need to be shifted throughout the implementation of the department so to just keep that in mind that we are still working through everything thank you so much for that and we have former community member russ vernon jones who has joined us russ would you like to say hello to everyone Hi, everybody. I can just say it's a uh, continues to be an honor to work at putting all this together and uh, have a great team to work with. Thank you. So I'm now going to go ahead and share my screen with the slide. The PowerPoint. And can we all see the PowerPoint? So as we said earlier, let's meet the implementation team. These are the implementation team members. The implementation team was tasked with determining the scope of CRESS, the relationship, building a relationship with police, fire, and EMS, identifying calls directed to CRESS, the project number of CRESS responders and the size of the department, developing the job descriptions and recruitment of applicants, reviewing communication protocols, the development of outreach efforts, and creating training requirements for CREST staff, and developing program details, including policies and procedures. Uh, the reason for creating this department is to provide community safety services in situations that don't involve violence or serious crime. It will create a civilian unarmed alternative to calls that might otherwise require response from the police department. The purpose is to ensure that any public safety response is an anti-racist, equitable, just and fair, and that we offer preventative services that get at the root of assisting our community members to avoid necessitating police public safety involvement in the first place. CRESS is really funded. We have $250,000 of ARPA funds that have been allocated for startup costs. There has been 90,000 earmarked from the state. We recently received um, a grant from the DPH, which we are applied for with the African Diaspora Mental Health Association. Sorry about that, that's backwards on there. Um, 
for $450,000, which splits the cost for $250,000 for startup costs. All of the positions will be funded through tape, um, town funds through the budget process. Crest will be located on the third floor of the Bang Center. There will be a direct one full time director, eight community responders that will be full time, a full time administrative assistant, a full time but temporary project manager, and a full time but temporary transitional assistance coordinator. Our hiring timeline, we hope to have the director and project manager positions filled by the end of February and the transitional assistance coordinator position in March. We also hope to create and post the community responders and administrative assistant positions shortly after the hiring of the director. The community responders will work in teams of two. Our goal is to have one responder with clinical mental health expertise and one with de-escalation mediation skills on each team. We will also seek to hire responders with a variety of experience and expertise, including uh, homelessness, substance abuse, um, and working with youth. And at any of time, if anyone from the implementation team wants to jump in, feel free to do so. Training. We expect that the initial training of Crest responders will take about eight weeks. Uh, we've included, but it's not limited to, de-escalation and mediation training, um, understanding and knowing the local social services and agencies, uh, knowing how to use the communication equipment, Record keep our record keeping system, town bylaws, how to identify when to call APD or EMT or a Amherst Fire Department, and of course, first aid and CPR. Equity, awareness, and social justice considerations with regards to race, class, disability, religion, LGBTQ plus persons, age, homelessness, etc., is a preliminary list that will be expanded, and training will be continuously continuous after the initial training. Once Crest is fully staffed with eight responders, we expect to be able to provide 24 seven coverage and response. A team of responders will be on duty at all times of day and night, except from 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, when a team will be on call. The on-call team will respond in person if needed. This is the period of the week with the fewest calls. The on-call arrangement is necessary because eight responders is not enough to provide full 24 seven on-site coverage. And our information, we worked with LEAP who um, were, was our consultant and they went through and, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Russ? This is your thing here. Um, they went through the call log to kind of determine what calls and what time of the calls it's necessary to have the most coverage. Yeah. Accessing the Crest Department can happen in multiple ways. You can call the published number that Crest will have. We can, you can call 911 and ask for Crest. You can call the Amherst Police Department business line and ask for Crest. There's walk-ins at the Bang Center and all calls will be answered by the Amherst Communication Centers that currently dispatches EMT fire, and APD. Crest responders will not be sent to situations that involve violence, weapons, or criminal activity. Dispatch will be required to send police officers to those calls. Um, the dispatch will be trained to route calls to the appropriate public safety department. They will always ask if you would like to be connected to Crest, if this is one of a call that falls under the categories of nonviolent, no criminal activity, and so forth. Cress and APD will stand ready to assist each other if needed. If the APD arrives at a situation that they believe could be best handled by Cress or with the assistance of Cress, APD officers can request Cress responders join them or take over for them. Similarly, if Crest responders arrive at a situation and discover that is dangerous or a violent situation, weapons are present, or a serious crime is occurring, they will call for the Amherst Police Department. The Town of Amherst and ADMHA apply jointly for a DPH grant, and we are awarded the funding. The grant will enable ADMHA to establish an office in Amherst and provide services to community members. One of 
the major functions of CREST will be to connect community members to appropriate local services, including ADMHA and other agencies. The ADMHA stands for African Diaspora Mental Health Association. Vehicles and equipment, the CREST responders will be equipped with two dedicated electric vehicles large enough to be stocked with first aid and other supplies to provide emergency transport for clients. We'll also be equipped with communication equipment that will enable them to be in open communication with the communication center and allows dispatch to know whether or not they are currently engaged. Press will have its own record management system in which confidential case notes will be maintained, separate records will be kept that enable dis dispatch to see whether Crest has previously responded to any caller or address. Appropriate data showing numbers and times of calls, types of services needed, and demographics of community members served will be kept for the Crest activity. This will enable appropriate compliance with public records requests and appropriate reporting to the town. commitment. We are committed to successfully implementing the CREST program. We expect to learn from our experience as we begin, begin implementation. We expect that we will need to make some changes as we gain experience. So one of the things that is most important in this process, because this is for the community, is that we have feedback from community members. So we are now going to open up to um, questions and or comments or feedback from the community. So I'm going to ask if anyone in the community has um, a question or a comment in regards to the CREST program. Hi Zoe, welcome. Could you just state um, what town you live in? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Zoe Crabtree and I live in Amherst. Um, could somebody speak to the way that the hiring process is going currently for the director and implementation manager? It just have we gotten applications? Um, are we looking for more outreach? How is it looking? So there are a considerable amount of folks for the implementation project manager has fewer applicants because it's not a temporary position. It's not a full time position. It's temporary. But we do have um, very qualified candidates that have applied. And so we are actually interviewing for the three candidates tomorrow. And the Crest director, the hiring committee has just been formed and so the applications will be forwarded we did there are several um individuals who applied for that position thank you you're welcome sister Hala lord yes thank you I believe I heard you say when there are weapons involved, the police department will be called. <clears throat> My question is, could the Crest team also be involved? Because often sometimes mental illness and a weapon come hand in hand, and maybe the, um, the combination of both expertise could be helpful to deescalate that moment. Yep. Does someone from the group want to take that? I can take it from a perspective of the um, initial response um so because of the potential dangerous situations that both police officers emt people and the crest responders may have to respond to anything that involves um something of a dangerous potentially dangerous or when we know there's a weapon involved the initial response will be from a police officer and i think as jen moisten mentioned earlier in the powerpoint presentation once the um, police officers establish and, and or secure us the scene, and it's something that the crest responders could could handle, then they will absolutely be asked to come to the scene to assist with that. Um, but we, we do have to err on the side of caution and safety. So the initial response would have to be for a, from a police officer. Um, thank you. So you're Welcome. saying there's, I'm sorry, a follow-up question. There's no opportunity for both to arrive at the same time? Um, I wouldn't feel comfortable with that 
quite frankly, um, you know, and things will and potentially could change in the future once we establish protocols. Uh, again, I think we've all come to the agreement that, you know, this is going to be, and we've used the term a living document until we can really establish what we are comfortable with for the crest responders to respond to. But initially anything that involves, you know, something of a dangerous or physical altercation or certainly a weapon, it would be a, initially a police response. Thank you, Chief Livingstone. You're welcome. I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, Deb Freyer just come, came into the room. Deb, could you please state the town that you're in? Hi, I'm in Amherst. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing. Deborah Ferreira, I was on the CSWG and one of the folks that uh, recommended the CREST uh, program. So I have several questions. <laughs> so you all can probably take some notes in terms of what all the questions I have. So one, I, I you know, it kind of went quick, but when will it be in place? So, you know, if you all can kind of go over, you know, the timeline, a little bit more, I would appreciate it, but when will it be up and running is my first question. Uh, second, uh, have you all identified who's gonna be the one providing training to the CRESS uh, responders? Cause that's gonna be critical, you know, um, who's going to be really making sure that they're gonna be responding in a way that's, you know, obviously compassionate, that's equitable, that's social justice fake, uh, focused, that obviously relates to dealing with all the different aspects of um, the people that they're gonna be helping out, you know, and obviously how to, to relate to youth and, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, second, that was my second. And my third is important. I'm, I was happy to hear that there's gonna be, you know, several different ways to connect with CREST, um, but what is going to be the uh, way to roll out, right? The marketing, that's going to be key. You know, how are you going to be letting people know that Crest exists? Um, I want to hear more about that. I want to really get some details on that. Um, and then lastly, how is Crest going to be assessed, right? Because obviously if people are going to use it, um, how is the budget going to be increased? How are the numbers going to increase and so on and so forth? But obviously in order for that to happen, like I said, it's gonna be important in terms of the advertisement and the marketing uh, rollout. So those are my questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, um, Ms. Ferreira. Russ Vernon Jones, do you wanna take the first question please in regards to um i think it's the timeline correct yeah, yeah the timeline you know it's hard to know for sure but uh we're hoping we have the director hired ideally within the month uh and we want the director involved in helping to hire the uh community responders so we would move very quickly once we have a director to um be hiring community responders but realistically, it's you know likely to be uh, into March before we have people hired, and if we then take two months for training, um, you know we're looking at April or May at the earliest that we would begin responding to calls. Uh, we wish it were quicker, but uh, we're doing the best we can, and we think it's important to pick the best people and have the director involved in some of the key decisions of staff about staff and hiring. Okay, thank you. Yep, um, Alicia or Brianna, do you wanna take the training question? I think as a group, we have talked about um, just the skills that we're looking for people to be trained in, but we haven't um, as a group brainstormed uh, individuals in the community we wanna seek out for training. So that's something we'll have to consider for future agendas. Yeah, and hopefully you all can also kind of maybe reach out to people. Um, you know, there was, you know, obviously some consultants we used in CSWG, maybe reaching out to folks to really make sure we, you, you get the best uh, people possible to provide the training. Mm -hmm. um, so the third question is how will we um, advertise for Crest? So I think, you know, part of it will be 
through having more and more community forums. Um, and then once the CREST staff is hired, like once the director's hired, we would obviously, and the imp implementation project manager want to have an introductory to those two new staff members. And as the um, responders come, do more community outreach in that way. And then, you know, as a group, we'll have to think about and willing to take suggestions and other ways to move forward with advertising. Is there is there funding for that? It would come out of the budget for for the crest department. Okay. All right. Yeah. Because like I said, that's going to be key. Like maybe like some commercials, you know, things like that. I mean, it's going to need to happen. Radio ads, you know, going into the community, talking to leaders in the community, in different communities that obviously don't speak the language, that don't speak English. On, so I mean, it has to be a very wide um, outreach, not just the, on the website, not just on the newspapers or whatever. It has to be very multi-level outreach. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and then you wanted to know how it will be assessed. And it is, it's hard if you're looking at it through the fiscal year, obviously we won't be able to assess it on the fiscal year portion because once we get started, it will be into April or May. Um, but the implementation project manager, that is part of their job is to create a, a, a measurement ma matrix for this program. Okay. And will there be kind of like through forums, letting people know uh, about the assessment and how that goes? So this is an alternative public safety department. And so everything, there needs to be an open communication line with the community and the department itself. So it, we will have several forums throughout this entire, this department throughout its lifespan here at the town will have several um, community right. forms. And Russ? Yeah, uh, Deborah and others, I we're taking notes as you say these things, and thank you for your input already, but we also welcome input. Uh, anybody in the community has folks they want to recommend for us to look at for the participating in the training or particular marketing ideas, um, or even, you know, things you want to be sure are included in, are included in the assessment. Jennifer, those can be sent to you, right? Yes, they can. Um, I can always be reached at, um, my email is moisten, M-O-Y-S-T-O-N-J, at amherstma.gov, or you can reach me here at the town manager's office at 413-259-3002. All right, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Hello, Mr. Hartwell. Hello. Uh, my, my name is Ash Hartwell. I'm a resident of, um, of Amherst. And um, first, just congratulations on all the work that you guys have collectively put together. And uh, I think, as everybody has said, that it's so important to have uh, really good communications between the PD and the fire department and the, the, the whole thing to, to work in unity together. I, I wanted to ask the question of whether or not um, have you advertised, I think you've already advertised for responders and if so, um, what kind of response are you getting? Are, are you getting uh, enough candidates who look like they would be um, first uh, a good proportion who would be people of color and also uh, the kind of people that you're, you're looking for? Or is this, is this a, a significant challenge of getting enough good candidates because there's a lot of recruitment going on. There is. Um, at this moment, we haven't started to advertise for the responders. We are hoping for the input from the director on the job description for the community responders and then to advertise then. Okay. okay thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Do you have additional questions? No, just that was a main one because I think, I think the team of responders is going to be incredibly important here. The nature and their training and their um, and, and, and the trust that they can build um, with the community. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Oh. Did I just lose Miss Pat? I thought she came in and then 
It looks like you have uh, three hands up, Jen. Two hands up now. Yeah, no, I was trying to let Miss Pat come in. Hi, Miss Pat. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure if you know that you're muted or. Hi, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. So first of all, I want to thank all of you for your time on this project. As um, a former member of CSWG, um, I'm glad that um, you all are working towards launching this program. I remain concerned around overnight shift. I'm feeling that the program is set up to fail already. So I'm, I still remain concerned to just have one person to do the overnight. It just doesn't, it still doesn't make sense to me. Another question that I have, I have a question actually regarding the communication center. How many people of color currently in our town I employed to um, take emergency calls in terms of you know dispatching calls. So, so I want to I want to that question to to the chief. I'll defer that to the, the the communications director. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oversees those folks. So currently we have um, one gentleman of color from the town of Amherst um, and we have two other BIPOC members and um, we have another uh, person from Germany that works up there. So we have a total of, had a total of 12 people on staff. So three are um, BIPOC. Are this staff like, do we have like bilingual, like Spanish speaking dispatcher? We have three Spanish speaking dispatchers and a German um, speaking dispatcher. We also have access to uh, a language line, which is basically a one button transfer where we can um, access a language line. Some of the biggest issues we have with um, like our Khmer speaking population, our Chinese speaking population, um, our Spanish speaking population in town um, are to the point, you know, we can communicate, um, at least figure out what the main problem is and then switch it over to a language line if we don't have a Spanish speaking dispatcher on duty. And the police department also has uh, several Spanish speaking officers that we can use as resources. And so that I know, are there any staff members who speak Creole? There are not. And what is the plan for translation services for CREST program? So anyone can take this question. When you say transmission services, are you talking about radio communications? I'm, I'm talking about if somebody from our community were to call for help and they don't speak English. So that and would be... And then they speak maybe uh, Chinese or Creole. Okay, yeah. Okay, so, so that would be depending on how the call came into us. If it came via 911, our first uh, first action would be to start officers out that direction because we'd have mapping of where the call came from. If it came over our business line, we'd be uh, a little behind the eight ball there. We'd have to access a language line, determine what the language the caller is speaking and then proceed from there. That's why we really push people to use 911 as much as they can, especially uh, people who aren't fluent in English or Spanish um, to use the 911 lines because we have, it's a one button touch. We get a language line person. We say, we believe they're speaking Creole within 30 seconds, 45 seconds. We have an interpreter on the line. In the meantime, we at least have officers headed that direction to hopefully they get there and can try to determine what's going on as well.
And so if somebody didn't call 911 and they don't speak English and they, you know, they're not um, Spanish speaking, what would happen if they oh, called oh. alternative number? They would, we would have to conference them in on a language line, which would take additional time because we would not know where that person was calling from initially. So it would take the time to get a hold of the interpreters, figure out the language that the people are speaking, and then go from there. Thank you. Ms. Jennifer. Yes. Does the town have translators on hand if somebody after the after the crisis, like, do, do, are there like, um, is there a budget for translation for services beyond, yeah. Like when they come in, if, if somebody were to go to Banks Community Center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that right there would, I mean, we haven't really discussed it into the, to that degree, so I'm glad that you brought that up. But if they were to walk in and they didn't speak the language and there wasn't anyone available who spoke the language that they were speaking, um, we still would need to have services. So there would have to be some type of translation, uh, either you know using a, the computer or the translation line. They could we could possibly send them. We just haven't really thought about it thought that through all the way yet. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Pat, do you have any other follow-up questions? I will wait for other people. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, thank I'll you. Wait. <laughs> and Ian, could you just let us know where what town you live in? And a few more. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I am Ian uh, from Amherst, um, and I was just wondering about uh, what the relationship will be like between Crest. Um, I, I know this is a, a town um, uh, governed institution, but the relationship between Crest and the University of, of Massachusetts or uh, Amherst College, um, given that you know, UMass has a sizable police department of its own, will the MPD uh, no, is, is UMPD in these com conversations? Are they aware of Crest uh, and um, utilizing Crest's services? And and then going back to uh, Deb's question of earlier, um, will the uh, advertising be, uh, target um, students on, on campus as well? Is there anyone who wants to Go ahead and try and answer that question. I mean, I'll take a shot at it. It was, it was a little bit um, broken up on my end. So I, it sounded like Ian wanted to know if there was gonna be a relationship with the Crest responders and the UMass, uh, the UMass community. Is that correct, Ian? Yeah, essentially. What does the UMass Police Department know about um, Crest and, and utilizing Crest's services? So they certainly know about the program that the town is putting together. We have not broached the uh, topic yet of when Crest might be able to respond to the campus community or not. We were mostly concentrating on the Amherst community, but I can tell you that the relationship with other departments and the university has been pretty, um, you know, the, the relationship we have with the university police department University administration has been pretty fluid from the police end and the fire end. So, you know, once we get this CRESS um, program up and running, I don't see why there would be any issues with potentially having the CRESS responders be available in some way, shape or form to assist the University of Mass Police Department or the UMass administration. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, to the first part. And, and then the second part was just, um, I guess, letting students who are sort of a, a, a transient part of the community uh, know about Crest during their time here. Yeah, that's the point. So I think that would be part of the um, what Jen spoke with earlier about getting the word out about the Crest program 
I think um, Ms. Deb spoke about it as well, making sure that our communication reaches every aspect and every corner of the, uh, the town, and that includes the University of Mass, so that if somebody needed information that the Crest people could give them, that they make sure that they have that information available to them. Russ? Yeah, I, I think at this point we have to say thank you for that question, and we will put it on our agenda to think about. Um, I think we... It's, it's hard to know whether we are gonna be able to handle calls just from the town and what capacity we'll have to include the university, but we will certainly put on our, that on our agenda to think about and uh, figure out as we go forward. And you know, the other thing that can be added to that is that ADMHA will be here. And uh, mm -hmm. so it could also be used as a referral from the university too. So they are a mental health association, depending on, on, on the case, but um, they will offer and we'll have a transitional assistance coordinator who can help with follow-up work or can help with referrals as well. Great, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Do you have any follow-up questions, Anne? Uh, no, that's it. And so I just want to bring it back to the um, community to see if anyone else has any other questions or comments or concerns. I mean, this is a public, a, a, you know, we are one of the first towns to, to move this far in our local, in our area. And so I'm just, we're trying to get a good read of what the concerns are from the community. And so feedback is really helpful at this time. So I'm going to open it back up again. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Ms. Pat, do you have additional questions? If you do, can you raise your hand, please? Ms. Kathleen. Welcome, Ms. Kathleen. Thank you. So I do have a question. And um, it is about the police responding to an uh, incident where there's a weapon involved. And mm -hmm. my concern is about the safety of the person, particularly if they're a person of color, and how the police are trained, how the police are trained to de-escalate a situation and not just kill somebody, which is what happens pretty frequently around the country. But I'm concerned about the safety of the individual involved and how the police are trained to de-escalate a situation rather than escalate the situation into a killing that could be unnecessary. Thanks, Ms. Kathleen. Um, so we, we do a, a number of trainings annually in our agency in de-escalation. And I you know, think that our track record in this Amherst Police Department speaks for itself. And in, in addition, we have a number of officers on, on our staff who actually teach de-escalation at the police academies and across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So. Um, you know, I feel confident in the training that my officers receive. That's not to say that we're perfect and that we wouldn't take or look for additional uh, uh, individuals who may have some expertise in that field as well. But um, it is a mandatory requirement for training for all police officers in the Commonwealth. Um, and, and we adhere to all the trainings that, that are mandated and we go above and beyond that as well. So. Oh, that's great to know. And what do you do on a regular ongoing basis to um, just reinforce the training? So, you know, in our own agency, um, our de-escalation training, it, it, it's only mandated for four, uh, four hours of training uh, each year through the Mass State Police Training Council. But anytime we have any sort of um, training, whether it's firearms or uh, or anything uh, that involves any sort of act where an officer might have to use force, use a force training, we include the de-escalation training aspect. And 
we do it a number of times a year as an agency. And Gabe, did you want to add to that? I did. I just want to add that, you know, um, besides the uh, formalized training that we do receive, you know, on a daily basis, you know, we're, we're a small agency. So anytime that there's a critical incident that happens, you know, each shift will have a debrief on it to kind of break down the good and the bad and, and take lessons from whatever incident that just happened. We also take into account um, any uh, other local, state, and national incidents that happen. We have what, what we call roll call trainings. So anytime that there's an incident that's, that's really publicized, we'll break it down within uh, our own staff to kind of take a look at it and see what other agencies are doing and what we can do better and where the mistakes are. You know, any, any incident that happens, whether it's within our department or any other department, we kind of use that as a lesson within itself. So we are constantly training. Oh, thank you very much. That's good to know. Much appreciated. Thank you for your thank service to our community. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Kathleen. And Love Ben Ezra. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm Lev. I work in Greenfield, or sorry, I live in Greenfield, but I uh, work at the Amherst Survival Center in Amherst. And um, I have two questions, but first off, I just want to thank the implementation team for um, all of the incredible work in terms of planning things thus far, um, and also the depth of this presentation and sharing of information and opportunity for comment. I really appreciate that. Um, the two questions that I have have to do with active outreach kind of beyond the publication of the Crest number. And it feels like there's a key interaction between the public. And in this moment, I'm particularly thinking about our local population of people experiencing homelessness with the police that happens on the street in the context of I believe what's referred to as community policing, but just folks, police officers being out and about and kind of walking. Will Crest responders be doing something similar to that effect? That's my um, first question. And then my second question is, have there already been any plans or discussions about ways to engage local community organizations such as the Amherst Survival Center or others in terms of a process to um, connect folks to this new service that's available? Thank you. And so does um, someone from the implementation team want to answer the first part of her question, her first question? Russ? Yeah, we haven't made definite plans or written up protocols yet, but we've always said in our conversations that <clears throat> part of what crest responders will deal with is situations that they uh, encounter uh, in the in the community um, that haven't necessarily been prompted by a, a call. Um, so we, we've got a lot to think through there, um, but uh, I think that that is, that is on our agenda. Um, with regard to outreach, we, again, we have not tried to make specific plans yet. Um, but we have talked about the importance of building relationships and opening communication um, with uh, local social service agencies. Um, and uh, many of us are hopeful that we will soon have a director who can begin to uh, put some of these things into practice um, because it's the sooner they get started, the better. And I just, I wanna add too that with ADMHA and coming that that is, that's an organization that we hope to connect the local organizations with as well too. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks as well to all the community members who, is, who have offered comments and questions. It's really helpful to hear this dialogue. So appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kathleen, did you, oh, it's hard to tell, your hand is still raised, so I want to make sure it was from previously. And then in the meantime, I'm going to just go ahead and call on Ms. Pat. Yeah. 
Okay, so anyone can take this question. Um, can somebody explain to us if on a busy night, you have three or four calls happening at the same time and you only have two press responder on duty and all the four calls or three calls, are, um, they are not for police, but for press. How is, that, how is that going to happen with only two press staff on duty? Or one staff overnight? Yep, I'm gonna say, Alicia, do you wanna help answer that? And then I'll go to Mike. Yeah, so I think that we are looking at dispatch protocol in terms of if a situation like this would occur. So one will want to be keeping track of these things because this, this will build our case that we need more responders and that we need more funding to back those responders. Um, so when and if that happens, we will keep track of that. And then we will be giving the caller options, um, hopefully whether or not they want to wait for a crest responder to be available. Um, I think we're talking and thinking about how they can reach them by phone in the meantime, or if they would want the PD to respond. So those would be the options and we would give it those options to the caller. Um, but that is also still something that we are working on to figure out to establish the actual protocols that will determine that. And Mike? So Ms. Path, this is a common occurrence that happens right now. We call it, we refer to it as stacking calls and dispatch. Um, on a bad snowstorm, we may have 15 accidents and only three officers, sometimes just two officers because they're tied up on calls. So we prioritize the calls um, depending on the severity of the call. Um, there's times we have mutual aid assets if we really needed to go that direction. Things like noise complaints, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, noise complaints sometimes have to wait two hours before somebody, we can get an officer out there to free them up. We have limited resources in the police department, limited resources in the fire department. Um, we're, you know, have to rely sometimes on our mutual aid partners. I would foresee uh, calls coming into Crespi in the same way. We would prioritize them to a certain extent, but if they're non-emergencies, then we would let the caller know it could be 15, 20 minutes. Are you okay with that? Would you prefer to speak to a, a police officer if it's that type of call? If it's a call for Crest, but it meets the emergency criteria, we would be sending an officer anyway, so it wouldn't really be a Crest call. So um, it's public, uh, public safety, public service, and there's never enough responders for fire, police, or EMS. So um, we triage the calls and we prioritize them. So it happens every shift now. I, want, I have another question. So have the implementation team thought about staff burnout and if staff call out? Say you have two staff who are supposed to show up to work who are already trained, crest responder, and then one person called out. So what would happen? Rusty. Or chief? Yeah, what, what we've said so far is that um, absences as well as vacation time would be covered by overtime uh, from other trained responders. Um, and we haven't talked beyond that about uh, substitutes, but I just, I can say personally, I recently had a uh, rather skilled uh, person in the community tell me that they might be willing to be trained as a substitute uh, to be available for some situations. Uh, we haven't talked yet about whether that's something we're interested in or it's possible. Um, but it's, you, you raise a great, great question because it, it is going to be a challenge. Um, you know, if the, the flu goes through the Crest Department, um, it's, it's, it's going to be a tough situation. Thank you. Yeah. I don't want to uh, dominate, I don't want to dominate questions tonight, but as a former CSWG, I have mixed feelings of how 
the town allocated funding for CREST program is underfunded. So it's set up to fail, is the point I'm trying to make. There isn't enough staffing to take on this. And I appreciate all of you for your time, but it's not going to work. We don't have enough staffing for it. So Felicia, I hope being on town council, you can always bring that to, to the town council. It's not going to work. And I'm a very positive person. It's not going to work. And I hope that the town will be transparent to the community members. Um, is there, would there be a place on the town website where we can monitor how many calls without identifying anyone? Like how is this working? Who is served? And also, where do people take complaints to? Who, you know, if they have concern around services they're getting from Crest program, if they're looking for services from Crest pro program, but they were being um, helped by police and they don't want that, what is the avenue? Where can community member go and say, I call for Crest, but police ended up showing up? and I don't want police. Where do they go for complaints? So there was a couple of questions there, I think. Um, so the last part, I don't know if someone from the PD wants to answer that, but it seems that the police shouldn't be sent, the only way, if Crest isn't available, they, and it's not a, a crime or, a, have a violent nature or there's no weapons involved and they could wait for Cress to be available, but no police officer should be sent if there's not a crime or any um, foul activity. I don't know if someone from the PD wants to pick up from there. Oh, you're muted, Chief. That's correct, Jen. So if it's a a situation where somebody's just looking for a crest response and an arrest person available, and it's not an emergency situation. There'll be, um, we've talked about having a process available where they could leave a message, emails, any type, any type of communication for future outreach um, with either the crest responders or another town entity. So um, we, we've had these discussions, we haven't finalized what that would be, whether it be emails or voicemails, that sort of thing. Um, you know, we've talked about having um, communication available to the crest responders with cell phones, that sort of thing. Uh, it hasn't been finalized yet, but we wanna make sure that, and Alicia and or Brianna can jump in, that there is something available to an individual who may just need information and doesn't necessarily need a crest response. Um, yeah, so first I just wanted to thank Ms. Pat for all of her comments and concerns. I think these are really helpful for me and that I'm taking notes and writing these things down and I will be thinking about these things. Um, and that honestly, these are not all things that we have talked about as a group. And so I don't have real answers for you, but that I appreciate that feedback. And we have, we have talked about things like how will the program be assessed and how will we be able to measure progress? Um, we haven't necessarily talked as far through it as to how will that information be displayed to the community. Um, but I'm very glad that you're saying these things because I will be thinking and talking about these things now moving forward. Uh -huh. And Gabe, did you have something to add to that? No, I don't. Um, I can barely hear you though, Jen, just so you know. There we go. Look at that. Thank you. Brianna? I think Alicia summarized what I wanted to say. Yeah. And, you know, and my guess that, that to some degree, you know, similar to how the police department has uh, certain things available for the public, we would have to come up with some kind of similar equation for CRESS, but we still haven't had a full discussion about that yet. Um, so, 
as we move on. And again, part of the reason for having these uh, community forums is because while we are thinking about policy and procedure, the community knows best how they need to be helped and would like to be helped. And that's why it's so important to get the feedback. Um, so Pat, do you have another question for us? And did we answer all of your question? Yes, I'm good. All right, thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Ferreira. Hello, everyone. So I have a um, follow-up question. And thank you so much again for, for working on this and answering the questions so far. Um, so, you know, as I kind of listened to people and kind of thought more about, you know, Crest Response with APD working together, uh, one of the questions that keep popping up in my mind, and I would like you all to kind of give thought, and I, and I heard you, Chief Livingstone, in terms of like, when there's kind of um, violent, violent um, kind of call that APD has to be the first one to kind of be on the scene. However, I think you all need to think about what if it's, um, you know, someone who's been homeless that you all know about, right? And, and, and they haven't been getting the services and then they get to a point where they get violent, right? So, so that call comes in. You all know it's a frequent flyer, right? Someone that you've had a history with. So wouldn't that be a situation where you would be bringing in Cress with you? You see what I'm saying? I think there's gonna be a lot of situations like that or if it's a BIPOC person that has been dealing with drug situations or what have you, you know, I, even though it might be a violent call and your automatic response would be APD, I think you all need to think about a protocol or think about a way to really in, include as much as possible. And I think Cress, when, when these press responders are being uh, trained, they need to really kind of be trained about that, right? How to kind of go in with the APD and how is that going to work? And so obviously APD and CRESS are gonna to have to be trained together in terms of how do, are they gonna to work together in terms of those things. So it's not, it can't be in, in a silo. So I, I think that's that's the thing. I mean, you're hearing it from the community and from, from folks that are calling in, in that there's still this angst, right? The fact that the APD is gonna be still responding to a, a, a big majority of calls and so how is it that they can work more closely with CRESS and make sure that a lot of times it can be a team kind of effort as opposed to just the APD going on, all right, going out. So that's my first question to think about. Uh, well, I'll stop there and then I'll, 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 I'll answer, I'll ask my other one. So any responses to that? I mean, I couldn't agree more with you, Ms. Deb. Um, those are conversations that we have where and I think I've said this more than once, I, the relationship that the Crest responders, the Crest director, it, I think it's gonna grow as we get to know each other, both with the police department and the fire department. So there are gonna, once the Crest responders become established and they know people in the community that they've been responding to and working with, there's gonna be many, many times where they're not gonna even need a police officer to respond. And there's certainly gonna be a lot of times where a police officer may gets sent to a call where he's gonna be, he or she is gonna be like, you know, this is something that Crest can handle and Crest will be called in and vice versa. So, you know, I couldn't agree more with what you stated. Okay. Yeah, and I think that there are, go ahead, Miss Alicia. Sorry, Jennifer. Um, I also just wanted to add that I think, so when we approached when we first approach trying to figure out how things would be working, we're looking at the Crest being a standalone department. And so I think we worked really hard to figure out what aspects can be separated. And I think that was our first main focus um, because a lot of the models that we were looking at were co-responder models. And we decided that that was not the way we wanted to approach the situation. Um, so again, I think it's, it, the, this is why these forums are so incredibly helpful for us because now we can go back as a group and talk about this that we haven't necessarily talked out talked about in this way like in this approach um, because we really have been trying to focus more on okay which calls can go to Cress 
and which calls can go to PD. And we haven't really talked about in which cases would it be helpful or possible for a co-response model to happen when we were deciding that we didn't want co-response. So I think I really appreciate this comment and that this is something, again, we'll have to go back um, as a group and talk about more how that could work. And let me just interject real quick. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, because obviously we were part of those discussions since I was that, you know, CSWG member. And I totally agree with that. There's going to be a lot of nonviolent ones, right? It's just going to be crest. And that's that was our intent. And then obviously the violent ones. But I'm really thinking about the violent, you know, kind of situations and how those could be. You see what I'm saying? A co-response possibly. Or as what the chief is saying, if it's someone that has already built a relationship, even though there might be something going on, but maybe press has the relationship with that, you know, homeless person or the person that's on drugs or what what have you, right? And so then the, it, it might be Crest, you know, calls first and then the APD afterwards, you know, so it's going to have to, that relationship is going to have to be built. So I'm talking about more so, right, not the nonviolent ones. I'm talking about the ones that are violent that with potential of Crest also going in. So I think we need to kind of think about that um, because, you know, like I said, you know, from hearing this forum and obviously from, from feedback that we received before and the data that we collected previously, there's a lot of angst still, right, that the police APD is going to be responding to, you know, the violent at the, um, incident. So how can we make sure that those can also get de-escalated de as opposed to, you know, leading to anything uh, worse? Mm -hmm. And I think that we're trying to look at it as a, as a partnership in a way too, because there will be circumstances, you know, like for instance, an attempted suicide that affects the people in the household as well. And so while the police might have to deal with one aspect of it, Crest can help support the rest of the family. I mean, there's lots of different um, circumstances where Crest and the PD will have to work as a team. Exactly. And, and you know, unfortunately, we can't predict it to that degree necessarily at this point. It's really hard. It's one of these things that we have to move forward with with the best of training that we have. Mm -hmm. um, but, but hopefully, though, you know, this will serve, as Alicia was saying, as, as you know, food for thought. And as you all mm -hmm. are thinking about the training um, for the community responders and for others that are going to be involved in CREST and obviously for APD, that this also becomes a thought because when you got when you all are doing training hopefully you know that will be part of the material shared along with um crest and apd absolutely um does um anyone from the implementation team have anything to add to uh deborah's question okay i just want to add that um you know that's something that we we will certainly we want to keep in mind because unfortunately, you know, without a director and without actually putting this into play, you know, there's going to be a lot of lessons learned. There's going to be a lot of um, um, feeling out to kind of make those decisions. Um, so it's a work in progress. Um, you know, a lot of the different programs that I've seen across the country have a tiered response. So they have uh, different types of responses. And I think that once this uh, CREST program is in play, you know, the fire department, the police department, and the crisis agency, we're all going to work well together and figure that out. So um, I think it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question is more so, again, from, from hearing uh, folks today and, and questions that they, they were asking is around, you know, training. And obviously there's a training for the press. And then I know someone had asked a, tra a training question for the APD which, um, you know, with CSWG, we have talked about that as part of our, you know, part B kind of recommendations. But I think since we are talking about training for CREST and APD, since APD is going to be responding to the violent incident, is to really think more, you know, I hear you all that you all get all the kind of standard training that you need to per the, per the state and so on and so forth. But it, it in terms of what the data that we had collected from BIPOC populations, and obviously, as you all know, the fear that they communicated that they have um, in terms of interactions with APD, the, those, those trainings that you all received, that's that's baseline. You know what I'm saying? So it needs to go way beyond in terms of training. 
So therefore, you know, one of the recommendations that we have, we had talked about was to make sure like even to have, and that's something you all need to think about, you know, some type of in-house person that's going to be really there providing training, evaluating, assessing how APD is responding to incidents and really kind of going beyond that and going on, on a, you know, more kind of, um, you know, more immersive kind of process with the APD. It cannot continue to just be these one-offs or these trainings that you all get, you know, that the state and the feds recommend you all to get. You know, we're really asking for something more intensive, something more immersive and something long-term. Um, and I think that, you know, because as you all know, training doesn't work unless it's something that really is going to be there, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Like that. So for me, th that's something else that you all need to think about um, and how is that going to happen? Um, and, and someone obviously that's also aware of the, what, what the community needs. And when I say the community, I don't say just one slice of uh, uh, Amherst members. I'm talking about all of the community, including BIPOC, folks that don't speak English, you know, folks that you know, are homeless, folks that have all the different issues that we're trying to, to deal with. So, you know, that's you know, that's something that I'd like you all to kind of, you know, talk to me more about, but I think you already said it, but I don't know if you have anything else to kind of share in regards to that. I'm gonna defer to uh, Captain Ting and Chief Livingstone for that one. I mean, yeah, that was a lot of information, Ms. Debs. Um, I can tell you we haven't, we haven't finished our list of all the trainings that we are trying to anticipate press members will be receiving. I know we know that it's going to change and we know that it's going to be extensive and we know there's going to be some cross trainings with both police, fire and who knows else. I mean, we, I know we're going to get a lot of input from the community about potential people who would be good fits for press, police and fire. So I don't have an exact answer for you right now. I can tell you that those are discussions that we've had and will continue to have about the exact perfect trainings that we think we can come up with. Um, and again, we keep going back to once the director's in place, making sure that the director of the CREST program is an integral part of the trainings and the types of trainings that the CREST members are gonna be getting. Okay. Um, Captain Ting, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think the chief said it, said it well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, this is something that obviously, as you all know, we're all very much invested in this. So obviously we are going to be looking intently in terms of everything and, you know, the community is invested and we're going to be following this very closely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And Ms. Ferreira, do you have any additional questions? No, no thanks. I'm good, thanks. Yeah. And I'm gonna invite Zoe back in. Hi everybody. Um, I was thinking based on one of the things that Ms. Pat said a few minutes ago um, about the, the way that uh, data on CRESS is gonna you know, hopefully be available to the community. Um, I just wanted to weigh in a little bit about the way that data on the APD is currently available to the community um, and provide some feedback on that so that hopefully that can be improved and, and also thought about when thinking about how to do um, data for the CRESS department. Um, right now, the call and arrest uh, record information is updated kind of on a month-to-month -month basis uh, in PDF format uh, to the website. Um, it also, at least the last time I looked, it went back maybe six months or something and, and anything before that wasn't publicly posted. Um, it would be really, really awesome if that data was available in a more um, malleable format, like an Excel spreadsheet, for example. Um, one of the things that I did a couple summers ago, um, just because I know people who have coding skills, is we wrote a program to trans, like to transform the data in the PDF documents into a spreadsheet format so that we could do 
broader analysis to see what types of calls there were and when they were coming in and things like that. Um, but that was like, you know, a lot of extra work to do in order to get access to public information in a way that was helpful. Um, so I, my understanding is those documents are probably the, the things that your system automatically export um, for you, uh, which you know, I'm all about having easily created reports. Um, but if there's a way uh, in your system or a way to, to change some of the ways that you're exporting that data in a, in a manner that would make it more accessible to the public, as simple as an Excel spreadsheet um, and as you know, awesome and interactive as a, a data dashboard for the public, um, that would be, I think, really, really helpful for folks. Um, so I guess so that just leaves, so I know that in our system that we use for the website, there's an archive section. Is Are the previous um, reports from the PD not available after a certain period of time, or are they in the archive as well? I'm not sure. The, the place that we're like the, the page on the website that has um, linked uh, call and arrest records um, doesn't indicate that there is another place to see older pieces, but that it may might be hidden in the archive somewhere. Yeah. And then yeah. Chief or Gabe, do you know anything about that? Yeah, I mean, we know our records keeping system is old and antiquated. It's 30, 30 something years old and um, you know, what Gabe and Ron Young, Captain Young are the ones that have to really extract all of that information whenever uh, they're requested. So Gabe probably can speak better on that. Yeah, unfortunately, this the system that we have, um, you know, doesn't really lend to the issues of today. You know, a lot of times the data that we want to extract and mine out of uh, the system is really difficult and cumbersome. Um, a lot, of the, a lot of the requests that I receive, if I can mine that data, it's usually handpicked. So it, it takes a, a great amount of time. Um, so if it's something that we can extract, we certainly will do our best. Um, but that's not always the case, unfortunately. And were you guys working on a new interface for that or? So we're starting so a couple of things. Oh, go ahead, Gabe, sorry. Oh. I was just going to say we're starting to look into it. Unfortunately, the, the company that um that we utilize got bought out, and the new corporation that's using it isn't really investing too much more into it. Um, so it, it might be the end of the line for this particular system. So we are starting to look into newer systems that will be able to to focus on a lot of the data that we really want today. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Enzo, do you have any additional follow-up questions or questions? No, just uh, hoping that you all will be thinking about that as, as one of the aspects of, of this implementation and accessibility of information to the public. Absolutely. Thank you. And Mr. Hartwell again. No, thank you. Um, I wanted to pick up again on the on the questions of training. Um, this is a field that I I've had a lot of experience with, and and generally what we find is the best training, especially under a, a where you're trying to learn as you go, is to actually systemically use the feedback that Gabriel Ting you spoke of uh, when you have incidents, using the actual data and the experiences that people are getting on the ground on a very regular basis to get feedback and do, in this case, probably a joint um, review and learning from that. Um, but that takes some resources and time. It, it doesn't just happen. And uh, uh, usually scheduling something, and that means to think about the downtime where there's not a lot of demand and seeing whether or not times can be set aside to do a regular feedback on what is happening collectively so that, uh, so that the learning can be uh, you know, really reflected on and, and, and analyzed and used. But that, that's gonna take a, a bit of a plan and uh, facilitation. So I, I, I wonder if that's something that you're already uh, 
already working on or um, um, it, I, yeah <laughs> it's part of the assessment but it's more than the assessment it's actually how to actually use the learning as you go to build a better support system that's it I can kind of briefly answer that we you know within our implementation meetings we have certainly had those discussions in terms of um, how the CREST program is going to function in terms of records keeping and uh, being able to be transparent to be able to provide that data. Uh, so that has certainly been within our conversations um, over and over again, to be honest with you, because uh -huh. uh, we do want to be transparent. You know, within the police department, uh, annually we have, a, a, we analyze a lot of our data and we have constant evaluations to see where we can do better and where our mistakes are. And that's the same goal that we're going to have with the CRUST program as well. Oh, thank you. And Mr. Hartwell, do you have um, a follow-up or additional question? No, that's fine. I just, I'm glad to hear your, it's very central to your, <laughs> to your planning. Well, I mean, yes. And part of it is too, is that we have to have a, a a really good matrix because the goal of this is to keep this program running um, and for it to grow. And so we have to be able to show that there's that need. So our, our data collection is very important. And I'm gonna allow Ms. Pat back in. Okay. I got a couple um, text messages. Um, from folks, they are wondering if this forum is being recorded so that they can view it. And they're wondering when can they be able to see it? Because mm -hmm. due to time conflict, they were not able to join tonight. The second thing is, I'm wondering how many people tuned in tonight for the forum? Yep, okay, so yes, this is being recorded. And um, folks can reach out to me again at moistenj at amherstma.gov to receive a copy of the recording. I'm trying to think if there's a, well, we can actually have it put on our, our web, our YouTube page, but also the PowerPoint can be available too, if people would like that for their own records as well, or just to have for information. And I think the highest count that I saw in the attendees was 23, which I think from our first community forum is maybe two or three times the amount of individuals that we had. So we're moving forward. Thank you. You're welcome. And so I'm going to go ahead and put another call out to see if any other um, community members have any comments, questions, or concerns. And again, you can always reach out to me with those if you don't think of them right now or if you don't want to speak and I will bring them to the group. And again, the I will have them place this on the YouTube channel. You can also reach out to me for a copy of the recording. I'll have it, you know, access for it tomorrow. And you can also, the PowerPoint is also available. Miss Alicia? I just also wanted to add that we'll be having another forum as well. Um, so if that works for their schedule, we'll also be here um, on Saturday. Thank you. Yes. And so we're, we're coming up to the closing time and I don't see anyone else's hand raised. So I would like to bring it back to the implementation team to ask if any members have anything that they would like to add or respond to. Or just a general thank you for the community to the community. I just want to say, I want to say thank you to everybody. Um, the questions that were raised were, were really valuable. You know, as the chief mentioned, this is a living document, which means everything's a work in progress. So the input that was given from everyone is, is truly valuable and, um, and we really appreciate it. So I want to say thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Vernon Jones. No, oh, I think Captain Ting said exactly what I wanted to say. Um, and that we welcome suggestions and comments and recommendations for things for us to think about, we welcome on an ongoing basis. Yeah, Ms. Alicia? 
Uh, so I basically just want to echo everything that's been said. Thank everyone for taking the time to come out tonight um, and let you all know that your feedback is really invaluable and it's going to move us forward. And I will hope that you will continue to engage with the implementation team so that we can really meet the needs of our community to the best of our ability. So please feel free to reach out, even if it's not during a forum. Anyone else? So I'll throw on a quick, quick word if you like. I think, you know, I think folks, folks need, need to remember, remember that this is this is brand new. We do do doing some, something here that has not been done before. So there's going to be fits and starts and good good days and bad 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 days. In in the end, you've got to focus focus on what we're trying trying to do. I what I what I like like to say is right at the end of the story first. That and then you and then you, you can fo 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 focus on the good that we're trying 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 to do. We're not going to be be, be able to what what if every single situation as you know Scott or Gabe Gabe will tell 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 you every every day is different in 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 this world, in this public, public safe, safety world. So you got to accept that, you know, we're, we're going to run or run into, into things that we've never thought, 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 thought of. And that's not a bad, bad thing. That's just, just the way, way, that's just, just the way it is. But it's, it, as, and as Kate Gabe said, this is going to be a work, work in pro, pro, progress. It's going to be a little living thing. It's going to take, take a while to get, get to the point where we're, we're saying, yeah, I think we've got this. But it's gonna, it's you know, it's 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 a you know, it's a mar mar marathon. It's not a, it's not a not a sprint. But where where we end up is going to be a good good place. And it's because there's a lot of folks here that want want this to work and work well to get together. So in the in the end, as I said, we're going to end up in a really good good place. Thank you. Um, anyone else? I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I took a lot of notes and I'm really excited to continue to have these conversations with the implementation team. And I hope you all continue to join us as we develop Crest for the community. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to reach out to the community again to see if there's one more for one more call to see if anyone has any questions or comments. Yes. OK, oh. And I'm going to invite Ian back in. Ian? Um, sorry, this just has to do with funding that you had mentioned that it, it uh, is hope it, it will be linked to the hope, hopeful growth and expansion and continued use of CRESS. Um, are, is it totally contingent on that? Or are there other uh, ways to CRESS to, to get better funded? Um. Ms. Town Council Member Alicia Walker, would you like to answer that one? Uh, thank you, Jennifer. So I also don't actually have um, an answer to this question. Um, I'm hoping that that is not the only way, um, but this is also a learning pro uh, process for myself as well. Um, and so I think that what has gotten us this far is really advocacy. So I think that the best route is for the con the community to continue to advocate that this is something that they want and that they need. Um, and that if we can really get the town, the rest of the council, and it's, it's a lot of planning that goes behind it. But I think that just continuing to express the need from the community to the council and to other, the finance committee and to the TSO committee and all of those essential places that it will, it will come together, but it's going to be a lot of footwork. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can all make this happen together. Right, and I, and I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of interesting because I think that usually programs are measured on their first year. And I, and I just feel like the way that we've jumped off, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be to our advantage to have it that way. So I think that the, the measurement length of time will be extended out. So hopefully we can have a, a more accurate, understanding of what's needed. Um, 
And so I'm going to go ahead and get ready to close. And I thank all of the community members who came and those who came and spoke. Um, please help spread the word that we're having another community forum on Saturday the 22nd from 12 p.m. to 1.30. Um, and we will keep everyone in the know of when our next and upcoming um, forum will be. Hopefully, we will be introducing a director soon. So please look forward to that. And um, I thank everyone. Good night.